This season, Netflix and Amazon seem to have Hollywood by its neck, as the talk of this season is not Thor Love and Thunder or even Miss Marvel, but instead The Boys and Stranger Things. Every time an episode of these shows came out, they seemed to be trending for days, and even Stranger Things seemed to overcome the Netflix binge issue, even though I don't think it's an issue. Staying number one show on Netflix for a month or two before another hit show, Umbrella Academy, came to beat them. To a boy's credit though, they actually seem to grow and get a lot of attention during a Stranger Things season, a cultural phenomenon three years in the making. Albeit they're very different shows, but that's still impressive. What's also impressive is that yet given all their differences, both shows seem to have fall flat this season on one end, which is their endings. No pun intended. And I don't mean both of their last episodes were all bad, they just both ruined them by both giving an unsatisfying death to a character that was becoming quickly liked. Eddie Munson and Black Noir's fan approval ratings seem to ramp up drastically in a matter of a few episodes. Because despite their screen time, or lack of it, they still managed to capture the audience's hearts. With Eddie, it was by his weird charisma that he had, especially in the scene in the forest where he was just talking to Christy and just everything flowed. It was chemistry, but it was not only chemistry, it was his charisma. He knew what he was and he wasn't afraid to be who he was. And he inspired others to do the same. And for that great amount of courage, the audience fell in love with him. And for Black Noir, it was his childlike demeanor. That scene of him in that ripoff Chuck E. Cheese showed that deep inside, He's just a child scarred by trauma, letting us relate to him way more than we have had in like the past two seasons where he did literally nothing. Like his actions in the season were just so humanizing that we kind of forget about everything he did wrong, like who he was in the comics, like what he did in Lagos, and like the fact that he's a bad guy. We kind of forgot that he's on Homelander's side, that we shouldn't be cheering for him. And we forgot for like the past two seasons, the dude has done nothing. We forgot all of that, and we just felt bad for him. And we just empathized with him. Just for them to kill him off the following episode. And this was a horrible decision. Like, horrible decision. And although the excuse I've seen from stands for these deaths on social media is that the writers didn't expect them to capture the hearts of the audience so fast, I believe this really did nothing more than emphasize the mistakes of these deaths to the audience. These are always going to be bad deaths, but them being the deaths of popular characters just made the quality of these deaths incapable of looking over, like the other lesser deaths that happened this season. But why were these bad deaths? Why did audiences from both camps dislike these deaths? Well, first, both of these deaths held no purpose at the end. And by end, I don't mean the end of the series or the season, but the end of the same episode. Which for both is the end of the season, but that doesn't matter. Homelander ends up rejected by Soulja Boy. And what did Eddie Munson do in the first place? Hold up the bats when that didn't matter because the crew was already trapped. And Super didn't matter because Eleven ended up killing them all anyways. What the fuck? Both of these deaths were so anticlimactic, which isn't a problem. Anticlimactic deaths are fine when done with a purpose and a narrative in mind, but these deaths weren't done with that purpose in mind. In fact, it felt like we were supposed to care about the event themselves, but we didn't at all. Which ties back to another issue, which I don't really know how to say, so I'll just say it. Although we cared about the characters, did we really care about their dev scenes at all? Like, not their devs, not the fact that they're gone from the show and probably aren't coming back, but the actual scenes in which they died. For me personally, and I know for a lot of people, I say no, which makes no sense, right? You care that the character passed away and that they're never coming back, but you don't care about the scene in which that happened? But it's true, and I think I know why. See, these two scenes were both individually trying to express a separate emotion, but these emotions were used to get to the same thing, a sense, a sense of overcoming, a sense that these two characters conquered their fears before they died, which is supposed to give the audience a sense of bitter relief for these heroes, leading to a depressing but satisfying death. And this usually works. Think of Summer's death in Game of Thrones or more popular Minato's and Kushina's deaths in Naruto. Is Naruto more popular in Game of Thrones? Is that a weeb take? Let me know in the comments. These deaths are actually great ways to kill characters off without making them feel needless or underwhelming. So what happened here? Why didn't it work in both shows? Well, the answer is easy. It's because there is no great sense of overcome in either of these scenes. Although they try to present one, 
It falls flat, and that's because we didn't care about these characters' fears, or the thing that they were overcoming, or at least not enough for us to make it feel like a conquest to them when they do the bare minimum. And that's because we didn't spend enough time with these characters' adversities or really truly witness them at all. I can recall Eddie saying he's a coward and all he does is run away twice before his death. And one of those times was the episode directly behind the episode he died, which to be honest was the Duffer Brothers blatant foreshadow of his death. And although this was such an issue in his life that he literally chose to die rather than be a quote unquote coward again, there is not one example in the whole show where I see Eddie being a coward or exhibiting blatant cowardice. It's like the Duffer Brothers expect us to look at him like he's Usopp or something, who's a coward because he constantly remains a realistic anchor in a world we and he have seen only contains insanity. But really because of the way Eddie's presented, the audience only sees him as a fish getting used to a new bowl, instead of the cowardly man he's supposed to be or we're supposed to deem him as. It's like the Duffer Brothers took the literary concept of show and not tell and flipped it on his head, telling and not showing at all, in fact showing the opposite. Because intrinsically and objectively, no action of Eddie stirs to cowardice more than it stirs to realism. To show this, let's recall the few scenes where Eddie runs away or hesitates. The first one being after Chrissy's death, when he gets in his car and drives off. Now, if you think this is an argument where this is cowardice or realistic, I guess I'm a coward then. Or you're insane. Like, if you think this is an argument whether this is cowardice or realistic, my fault. You got you got the biggest balls I ever seen. Like, I, I, you got it. You got it. You got it. Because I bet most of y'all, just like me, are passing out or staying on the floor and asking God, why me? Why me? If the girl you were about to sell drugs to became unresponsive, started floating, and her limbs started breaking in half before her eyes popped and she finally dropped dead in your trailer floor. Like, what do you want me to do at that point? In fact, I think Eddie showed an unreal amount of forward thinking here, knowing what would happen when the police showed up and the preppy girl was on the poor boy's floor brutally murdered, running away where most others would have been paralyzed by shock to avoid being arrested and later on being proven right to. Eddie then remained in hiding for probably days and weeks, which again is realistic when the cops and mobs of people are gunning for you because of a crime you didn't commit. Eddie's only act that can be seen as cowardly, and this is diving into alpha, 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 alpha male territory, I'm talking beyond Tate level views for men, is him not immediately getting off the boat and diving into a portal to another dimension that he's never seen before. And this is after he literally sees someone die at the same spot days prior. But guess what? He gets over it. And does it? Maybe because it's peer pressure, maybe because the cops are coming, but it doesn't matter because he does it. And super doesn't matter when he willingly goes back in the final episode and does the bravest thing ever. And that's the major reason why both of these death scenes felt so empty. Not just because we hardly care about their challenges at all, but because they already overcame these challenges scenes before. Although we hardly care to pay attention and focus more on the character moments themselves instead of them overcoming something. When Eddie got on top of the bus and started playing that Metallica song, I thought of two things. One being, oh he's so cool like he's really him that's like my twin for real and the other being good for him he's shown that he's a hero and that he got over his cowardice of course good for him shouldn't be the way one feels after a character in a story conquers their long-standing fear it should be more intense and greater than that but that's an effect of us not being shown that he's a coward but still in this scene i felt a slight sense of overcome a sense that was too full in black noir scenes when he decides to go fight Soldier Boy and the beaver hits him with that quote, I felt proud of him when he let that Chuck E. Cheese rip off. So how is that a problem? Well, the problem is that both of these scenes absolutely drained any emotional resolve that was created and left for these characters' qualms, which left their death scenes empty and anticlimactic. To show what I mean in a new perspective, I'm going to give you a pattern and you tell me if these are good character paths for emotional deaths, okay? Okay. Number one, introduce a hurdle and barely touch on it or touch on it at all even. Number two, show a scene where the character overcomes that hurdle. Number three, kill them off in a scene where they are trying to overcome the hurdle. See how that doesn't make sense? It makes the devs feel 
so unsatisfying and so illogical. But see, you can maybe get away with this if you're doing it with a nameless side character, since there is little investment. But main characters? Doing this with main characters is crazy. But don't get me wrong, I love Stranger Things and the Boys. In fact, after making the script for this video, I realized just how great the writing and acting is. The fact that these characters had so many issues going against them and they were able to become fan favorites is insane. Like literally all of Black Noir's character building was done in 5 minutes of one episode, where he barely spoke a word and people loved him. Eddie was so good that we became once again attached to a side character in Stranger Things. In Stranger Things, I don't think y'all understand how crazy this is y'all, like at least 4 of them died this season and we were still attached to Eddie. Like Eddie had people by their throats, like the MO of Stranger Things isn't kill off newly introduced side characters for emotional death. But this is why I have major issues with both of these deaths, because they could have been and should have been so much better, or to be honest, not have happened at all. I can get into how I would have done it, but that's a whole nother video. But shoot, it pained me to see me feel nothing in these death scenes, especially since I love to cry when watching TV. I think unleashing tears is a sign that the writer did a great job of writing. Man did I shed tears when spoilers for One Piece, Ace died. It was so beautiful. Even though the whole time I always knew was coming. I always knew. It's like a big spoiler in the anime community. If not in the community, you don't know this, but everybody knows that Ace dies. Even the people that don't watch One Piece. It's one of the biggest moments in anime history. So of course it's widely known and there's memes of it. And yet, when I watched that scene, although it had no surprise to it at all, and although I've laughed at the scene through the memes, it made me cry. For those who don't know anything about the anime and don't plan to watch it or read it, let me give you a brief summary. Ace practically died the same way as Eddie Munson did. See, after a whole war dedicated to getting him free, Ace is finally in the home stretch. He's finally a few steps away from base and is finally about to make it home with his brother, the main character. <laughs> then, one of the most backhanded villains in the series, Admiral Kainum sees everything falling apart for his side, the world government, and decides to do what he knows best. Hit him where it hurts. So he sets his sights on Ace and instead of running and chasing after him, he stops in a vicinity where he's hearable and just starts chatting shit. Your mother's a bitch. Your father's a bitch. Your fake father's a bitch. He's a bitch to your real father who abandoned you. Your pine crew ain't on shit. You'll never be shit. He'll never be Pirate King. You'll never be Pirate King. That's why you bitch asses are running away. You ain't on shit, pussy. Pull up. He basically told him, slide for Vaughn. And Ace, even though he was right there, all he had to do was keep running. Do what his captain told him to do, and he would be able to see another day. He did, in fact, pull up. He slid and it didn't end so well for him. He died a needless death that he didn't have to die. So why is this needless death so amazing and renowned? Well, it's because Ace, unlike Eddie Munson in Black Noir, is a great example of a tragic hero. Which is where these sort of needless deaths do their best work on, a tragic hero. Think of John Proctor, Willie Loman, and Romeo. All characters that died a death they didn't have to, yet it all felt so appropriate, so natural, so emotional because it was all propelled by their intrinsic tragic flaw. And like Foreman and Proctor, Ace's tragic flaw comes from a lack of self worth. But while this lack of self worth manifests itself in both Proctor and Loman as excessive pride, it manifests in Ace as a sort of lack of will to live. He just doesn't care about his own life anymore, or he just doesn't see the importance of it. And we get glimpses of this throughout the whole war, where he's just crying, wondering why so many people showed up to save him, like he doesn't understand that he impacted all these people's lives and more for the better, that he only believes that all he can truly be at best is a nuisance and at worst a demon. And throughout the war, you slowly find out the sad truth is that everybody in this war, navy or pirate, friend or foe, values Ace's life or death more than he values either. But because of Ace's incredible lack of self worth, when he does find someone that does value his life, someone that does give him unconditional love, he places more importance on even their name more than he places on his own life. 
which is why he turns around from Valhalla and the rest of his whole entire life when the Navy Admiral starts disrespecting his surrogate father with basic playground insults that are not worth dying for. Because to Ace, they are worth dying for. That's somebody who's loved him before he knew how to love himself. Which is also reason why he steps in front of his brother and takes a death blow, dying doing what he loves, protecting those that love him. And I can go more in depth on why his death was so sad, but that's not the point of this video. With Ace, I'm just trying to show that this death could have been done right if you gave the viewers a true why. Why should they care? Why should they be invested? Ace gives us that reason why. So let's go back to Black Noir's death. I see some fans of the boy say that the way that Noir is killed at the hands of Homelander is to show that Homelander is going psycho and it's to isolate him amongst his peers. Now with this, I completely disagree. It was simply just a glory death, something to surprise the audience, which really had no stakes or impact at all. Because let's say it was used for narrative reasoning. Just for the sake of it, let's say it was used to build up Homelander's character, right? Like a lot of people say. But what they don't understand is that means that it was used horribly and inefficiently. Think about this, right? If Black Noir's death was used to isolate Homelander, right? It's to show that he really has no more friends. Why would you then, at the end of the same episode, introduce Ryan? That's a horrible narrative choice. To remove the only person that Homelander can depend on makes sense, right? It's to isolate Homelander, to take him off his rockers way more, to make him go crazier, to show that nobody in the Seven is safe, which we already knew because he already locked up Maeve's ass and literally killed a Seven member this season. So I don't think we needed further confirmation of that, but... Okay, Black Noir's death will still be unnecessary, but at least it would make sense to Homelander's character, right? And have a minuscule impact. But then after that, you reintroduce the person that understands him the best. You reintroduce his son. That takes away all the impact that Black Noir's death and killing Black Noir had on Homelander. Like, that means at the end, Homelander just got a trade-off. He traded in Black Noir for Ryan, which means that at the end, Black Noir's death, once again, meant nothing. And to be honest, Homelander's delusions and daydreams and that Green Goblin scene they gave him already showed us how twisted Homelander's mind is without him having to kill anyone. So not only, once again, was Black Noir's death unimportant to Homelander's character, it was also inefficient. Like, trust me, we didn't need Black Noir's death to see how crazy Homelander's going. Especially not in that way. This could have been done way better, but maybe that's just me. And a counterpoint for Stranger Things, right, is first, I'm not going to spend too long on this because we already know that Stranger Things just kills off side characters for some shock value and immersion points, right? But a lot of people say that Eddie had to do what he had to do. He had to stay there so the bats couldn't go kill the three that were stuck, right? But the thing is, Eddie did not know they were stuck at all. Eddie didn't even know if he had to go back out there. So Eddie's death wasn't based on logic we all know this eddie's death wasn't based on logic unless the dude has like secret mind techniques and he's secretly 11 oh wait no he's secretly 12 he didn't know that at all which means the reason why eddie did it which is why i'm discussing his death based off a character driven plot point is because his death was purely emotional he didn't know what he was doing when he went out there so it really had no logic behind it he did not know that the crew was stuck so let's stop pretending he did what he did based off logical reasoning when he did it based off emotional reasoning. It's just that that emotional reasoning due to bad writing didn't really resonate with us. Depressing. Eddie Munson and Black Noir deserved more. Fly high guys. Still watching next season though. Bye guys. Thanks for watching and have nothing but a great night.